fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back to the House of Mystery on KFNX 1100 Phoenix Independent Talk Radio. And uh, we're back on the subject of... uh, Jack McCulloch and his recent release. And joining us is author of Piggyback, uh, Jeffrey Doty. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. Well, wow. it's been quite a week. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, for for you now, you you wrote this book um, uh, a, a little while ago. It must have been about two years ago. Yeah, October. It was released in October of 2012. Or oh. 2014, I'm sorry. Right, right. So what brought you to the case, first of all, uh, where you actually wrote the book? Well, it, it happened to be that I knew uh, two of the attorneys on each side of the case. I knew Thomas McCulloch, who is the public defender who represented Jack, and I knew Victor uh, Escarcita, who was the uh, uh, assistant state's attorney in the case, and uh, uh, actually one of the lead trial uh attorneys and I was friends with both of them and I kind of discovered that they were both working the same case uh, from opposite sides obviously and uh, you know I really wasn't interested in writing this Uh, you know let me start off by saying that at that time I was working as a journalist with an outdoors magazine and so true crime was about as far from what I was doing I was I was writing camping columns (laughs) And so true crime was about as far as you could get from what I was writing at the time. Um, But there's always been a little bit of a history freak in me. And uh, at the time of the conviction, it was released in the newspapers that this was the oldest cold case in U.S. history ever to be successfully prosecuted. And that kind of perked up my ears, and I thought, you know, hey, I know both attorneys in the case. Uh, I've got kind of a unique in, if you will, and uh, just for the sake of history, it ought to be well documented. So that's how I began the project. Now, I, I, I noticed you kind of have a different take than, uh, let's say, Charles Lockman did. Um, yes. What was, what was your take on this? Um, well, m- more about, you know, because when she um, went missing... There's there's differences in the timeline. There, uh, different opinions, I should say. Sure. And, uh, well, so we're let's let's kind of go through it how you see it. Okay. Um, well, here's here's what happened. I went into this thinking he was guilty. I absolutely believed he was guilty, 100. Uh, percent In spite of what my friend Tom was saying, uh, Tom McCulloch. Uh, in spite of what he was saying, I just I thought he was guilty. Uh, I bought the prosecution's timeline. I brought every I bought everything they said, hook, line, and sinker. I, I really believed he was guilty. Even after I interviewed him the first time, I still thought he was guilty. Um, their original timeline to establish this was that the kidnapping took place between six and six twenty p.m. on the night of December third, nineteen fifty-seven. And there was absolutely no argument from them. They agreed that uh, Jack McCullough, then known as John Tessier, uh, had placed a phone call at 6.57 to 6.59 p.m. from Rockford to Sycamore. What they were saying at the time was they believed that the phone call originated uh, someplace south of the city of Rockford, but still within Rockford's phone district, their area code, so to speak. And uh, therefore, there was plenty of time for him to kidnap, uh, for John Tessier to kidnap Maria at uh, sometime before 620 and reach this payphone at a mom and pop store or a gas station south of uh, Rockford 
in time to establish, so to speak, an alibi. And uh, I bought that. I believed it completely. And then about eight months later, I was able to file a Freedom of Information Act with the National Archives and get a hold of uh, part of the FBI records from those investigations, but an important part, uh, because it had all the interviews with the mother, the neighbor, the father of Maria, uh, people that had seen her and Kathy playing on that street corner. And uh, they gave times on the night of the kidnapping. They, when their memories were fresh, they were telling what time the kidnapping took place. And uh, or at least what time they had seen Maria still alive in the neighborhood. And uh, give you some examples. Uh, Mrs. Ridolph left the house with her daughter Kay uh, to take Kay to a music lesson, and they saw Maria and Kathy still in the front yard uh, and just starting to walk to the corner. That's at 6 p.m. Uh, between 6 and 6:15, 6 uh, Tom Brady. Uh, delivered oil to the cliff home on the corner of Archie Place and Center's Cross Street, and he saw the girls, uh, and they were alone. Uh, at 6.15, Mrs. R Ridolph, uh, Maria's mother, returns home and sees Maria and Kathy still playing on the corner, and they are still alone. Um, at 6.30, uh, another neighbor, Kenneth Davey, accompanied by a young married couple, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Piper, uh, saw the two girls playing alone on the street corner. The Pipers were actually moving in that day into the neighborhood. And um, sometime between 6.30 and 6.40, uh, Mrs. Stanley Wells looked out of her window and saw the girls uh, playing with an unknown individual uh, who was obviously Johnny. Uh, and... Uh, but it goes on. Uh, her own brother, Charles Ridolph, said that, you know, uh, between 6.30 and 6.40, he and uh, his uh, friend were in the den uh, listening to records when Maria entered the house. Uh, you know, that, that's Chuck Ridolph himself. Uh, at 6.40, uh, Maria's mom said Maria entered the bedroom, she was looking for a doll, and she left. Her father, Michael, uh, said sometimes between 6.30 and 6.45, he saw Maria enter the living room and get a doll out of the corner, and he said he was watching Cheyenne on TV when Maria came in. Now, I checked the TV listings at that time, and from 6 to 6.30 was only local news. From 6.30 to 7 o'clock was when uh, there were three TV shows that were on. I forget what the third one was, but one of them was Name That Tune, and the other one was Cheyenne. And they didn't start until 6.30. So there's no way that Maria could have been kidnapped any time before 6.30. And it was solidly established by the FBI. They checked the phone records. They checked with the manager of the phone company. And uh, they saw the phone records that uh, John Tessier made a collect call from 6.57 to 6.59 p.m. from Rockford to Sycamore. And we'll get into that a little bit more later on, perhaps. Uh, there's some interesting things about that call. But so it became real obvious to me that uh, there were huge holes in the prosecution's timeline. And I, and I had a conversation with Victor about it, and it was probably one of the last conversations that we had. Um, I, lost, I lost a good friend over this, and, and I'm really sorry that I did. I, you know, we haven't spoken since I published the book, except for one brief encounter in a store. And, uh, uh, but I knew I was risking that when I, when I had to write the, what I found. Uh, and uh, I asked him, what caused the establishment of 620 as being no later than that Maria was kidnapped? And the only reason that he gave me was that because it had to be then in order for him to make it to Rockford to place the alibi phone call in time. In other words, it had to be then in order for us to take away his alibi. So they were just making it fit. Yeah, ex 
exactly. Well, that's crazy. Uh. <laughs> it, it is. It is. It, it, I really think it, it's a terrible thing. Now, I understand, I, and still to this day, I believe that Victor believes that Jack is guilty. I, I truly do. Um, but uh, I think he just, I think uh, the information that the investigators gave him, because the investigators are the one that handed them the timeline, I think, uh, I think he just went with what he believed he was getting from reliable people. Well, yeah, it's a tough, a tough position. But uh, now the new prosecutor has a, a totally different opinion, or like he has the opinion sort of how you, you have it, and mm-hmm. and actually thinks he's um, innocent. So right. How, right. how does that sit then with <laughs> in, in the same department? You know, like uh, people that. Well, this is this is the new state's attorney. The old state's attorney left. And uh, the current st- uh, state's attorney, Richard Smock, uh, they were handed down guidelines by the Illinois State Supreme Court this year that said you can't just uh, prosecute for convictions. You have a duty and an obligation to make sure that justice is done properly, which is something that should have been handed down a long time ago. And they said whenever you find what you believe is proof, that someone is innocent, you have to act upon that to free them. And that's what he did. Uh, Jack filed his uh, post-conviction hearing uh, appeal, uh, I think it was last November. And uh, so Schmack began his investigation back then. And through the course of his uh, uh, investigation, he read both Charles Lachman's book as well as my book and uh, piggyback, and I think he uh, agreed with my logic and uh, went uh, in, into in-depth research into the FBI files, and then he came up with the new information by subpoenaing, uh, he subpoenaed AT&T out here, the phone, the phone company, to uh, provide him with the records from the old phone company in Rockford, uh, because they had taken it over. And the interesting thing about that was they were able to provide him new phone records, which confirmed that uh, that the call had been placed from 657 to 659 from Rockford to Sycamore. And because he had the phone number of the phone from the uh, FBI files, they were able to track down that phone and give him the exact location of the phone which was in uh, what had been the post office back in 1957 at 401 North uh, Main Street in Rockford, right in the heart of downtown. It wasn't at some mom-and-pop grocery store or gas station out in the country. It was in the heart of downtown Rockford. And on the second floor of the post office was the Air Force Recruiting Center where uh, John Tessier, uh, had been turning in his uh, physical uh, papers from his exam in Chicago uh, that morning, and uh, just as he said he had been. So it was, it was, you know, complete proof that his alibi was true. And uh, the interesting thing about it was, in order to verify for sure that that payphone had been in the lobby of that building. Uh, they went to the current owners, which are, um, which is the Rockford Park District now owns that building, and that payphone booth, while it was taken out, uh, I believe in the late 90s, um, it had been still in there with the same phone number since the 1950s, and uh, they had to confirm that with the woman who had done the billing for the park district. She had been retired about four years, but they found her, and she confirmed that that was the phone number, that that was the paid phone that had been in the park district uh, since the time of its purchase in, uh, I believe, the early 1970s. And as far as she knew, that had been the paid phone the entire existence of the building. And she told him, I'm surprised that you don't already have this information because I gave it to Officer Hanley uh, six years ago. 
and Hanley was uh, Brian Hanley was the investigating officer in Jack's case, and uh, as part of the 2008 to 2012 investigation, and he had never written it down and never reported it, even though he had that information. So you know you can draw your own conclusions from that. Yeah, yeah, doesn't look good. Uh, what led them to Jack McCulloch to begin with? Uh, his half sister Janet, um, from whom I guess there's been no love loss for a long time, uh, claimed that their mother on her deathbed uh, uh, confessed to them, if you will, that Jack had murdered Maria. Now, she, she, her mother was on her deathbed, and she was on Haldo and was suffering from some eye, undiagnosed mental uh, condition. Uh, that's how the doctor phrased it. Um, and uh, Janet claims that mom sat up straight in bed, grabbed her arm, and told her, you know, those two little girls, the one that disappeared, he did it, Johnny did it, you have to tell somebody. Okay? The other sister, uh, Mary Tessier, who was in the room, uh, contradicts that. Her testimony in court was that mom sat up in bed and said he did it he did it and that's all but they took that to mean that she was blaming John, uh, Johnny you know as they call her brother uh, who's now Jack uh, they they claimed that she was they knew she was blaming Johnny for uh, kidnapping and killing Maria Rudolph but uh, what I will say was my father in the last two weeks of his life uh, was also on Haldol, and he threw a vase at one of the nurses uh, and accused her of kidnapping my mother. So, you know, that stuff does things to your mind. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you, you can't, that should never have been considered reliable evidence, nor should it have been allowed into court. Yeah, yeah, you can't rely on stuff like that. Uh, not when you're taking away someone's freedom. So what other evidence do they have? Um, uh, well, that, that, was the, that was what got them started. The, the other evidence was uh, uh, Kathy Sigmund's eyewitness identification, uh, which uh, if you have seen the photo lineup that they presented her with, they presented her with six pictures uh, in 2011, and in those six pictures, uh, one of them was of John Tessier at, at roughly 17 years of age, um, so about a year younger than he was at the time of Maria's kidnapping. And it was a photo that had been taken at a party. And it had a dark background. It was kind of a grainy shot, as most party photos are. And just very unprofessional. The other five photos in the lineup were all from a high school yearbook. Well, several high school yearbooks, but all from about the same time uh, time frame. And uh, all of them are professional shots, that, uh, and they look uh, young men that are looking up and to the right, and they have suit coats on and ties, and it's just it's beautiful. They're beautiful pictures. And then Jack's picture, in contrast, has this dark background instead of the light background, and he's the only one looking straight out at the camera. And it's like playing on Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the others. <laughs> you know, which one are you going to pick? Yeah. Uh, the example that I give uh, to show how unfair that is. It's imagine that you had been in a hit and run accident, and the car that left the scene was a green station wagon. And 20 years later, they come to you, and they've got a photo lineup that has five photos taken right out of the dealership catalogs of green station wagons, and then one that's of a green station wagon in somebody's driving their driveway. Which one are you going to pick? Yeah, yeah, it becomes obvious, doesn't it? Yeah, and on top of that, uh, Brian Hanley himself administered the uh, photo lineup, 
and even at that time it was considered uh, not the correct policy for the investigating officer to present the photo lineup because they they always give nonverbal cues and as a matter of fact as of January 1st of this year it is now illegal for investigating officers to give the uh, photo lineups just because it's it's so suggestive in nature of which which person they want you to pick so where do you see this going now so they they basically uh, vacated the conviction yeah, they, they overturned, uh, uh, the judge vacated, the uh, set aside the conviction, and he's ordered a new trial. And in paperwork filed yesterday by Richard Schmack, the uh, state's attorney out of DeKalb County, uh, he has said that he is setting aside uh, the charges. He's, he's asking to dismiss the charges with prejudice. And that's both the uh, murder charges and the original kidnapping charges. And if the judge accepts his request, then that means that Jack will never be able to be put on trial for these crimes again, ever, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, do you think that will actually happen, or do you think that they will retry him? I no, I I think that that's what will, the judge will do. I really do. Um, the evidence is so overwhelming now that the original conviction has been set aside. Uh, the evidence is so overwhelming. I mean, as long as you're thinking with your head and not with your heart, you you've got to know that Jack couldn't have done it. Um, you know. I was the toughest to convince of anybody because that's not the book I wanted to write. I, I, I went into this, all I wanted to write was a simple, you know, historical document about the oldest cold case ever to go to trial. And I, I envisioned this, you know, six month project with, you know, four months of research, two months of writing, and no real emotional involvement. But the problem was, was I got into it and I met Kathy uh, Sigmund, now Kathy Chapman, and her husband Mike, and I liked them. They're salt of the earth people. They're good people. I, they just got used, and it's it's no fault of it's no fault of Kathy. I, I sure hope nobody ever blames Kathy for this. There was nothing she could have done. Uh, she was given a suggestive lineup. She was manipulated by an officer that knew how to do all the subtle things, I believe. I, you know, I, I can't say for sure because I wasn't there. Maybe he didn't, but it sure doesn't look good. Um, they were good people, and I lost, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I thought of them as friends at the end of our interviews, or at least, you know, good acquaintances, and they don't like me now, and I understand completely why. Um, I went in thinking I had this simple project, and I, and I wound up, instead of 150 pages and out in six months, I ended up with a two-year project, uh, tremendous emotional investment, and uh, just I was horrified to find that Jack was innocent. It was the last thing I wanted, but once I realized he was innocent, there was nothing I could do but tell the truth. And and now since then you've you've talked to him. Um, oh yeah. How how is he holding up? Oh well, uh, since uh, since being rele released, he's ecstatic. Uh, he's very happy. Um, he he has so much freedom. One of the things that he was uh, telling me was uh, he got some new clothes and they had little pieces of tape on them, like like. Normally, you know, when you go to stores, you get some clothes and, you know, lapels are taped down or whatnot. And he started to save them because in prison, you save tape because they don't dispense it to you. And he said, I, all of a sudden I realized I don't have to save it. And, and it's little things like that that he's having to get used to. Um, there have been times that that he's been a little overwhelmed by it all. Um, he told me uh, he went into a Walmart store 
and all the choices were just so much compared to what he's been used to for the last five years in the prison commissary. I mean, it, he said it was just so overwhelming. He got dizzy and he had to sit down. Do you think he's going to be able to go back to his old life? But I, I think he will. He, he's adjusting. Um, uh, he's discovered he loves cell phones. His, his daughter uh, gave him a cell phone, uh, Janie. Uh, and uh, so he he's discovered that he likes having the freedom to be able to talk for as long as he wants without being monitored. That's that's something he loves. And uh, so he's, he's slowly adjusting. And uh, I think give him another year or two and he'll be comfortable with life again. I, I think it's always going to have an impact because uh, he, he tells people that you don't realize how wonderful freedom is until it's taken away from you. And there's an adjustment to getting it back, but it's an enjoyable adjustment. So now, and what's your feeling? I guess, you know, uh, Janie, of course, is kind of come out and uh, she's been pretty um, vocal about uh, the prosecutor and the police should be, um, you know, um, uh, brought, you know, and be punished for the... I, well, yeah, I, th I think it's obvious that there was some uh, misconduct in this. I, I think it's pretty obvious. I mean, you cannot read the FBI files and go through them timeline by timeline with each timestamp. And I found in my going through, because I didn't have access to all of the FBI files, I found about 11 people that had Maria still alive after 630. And with the, and with the phone booth being in the middle of downtown Rockford, uh, some 42 miles away, there is no way that Jack could have you know, kidnapped her and then placed the call. There's just absolutely no way he could have done that. And yet it was obvious that he was there because not only did he place the call, he went upstairs and turned his paperwork in and uh, was seen by two Air Force officers there, uh, uh, Colonel Leibovich and Air Tech Sergeant uh, Froon. Uh, saw him in the building at 710. So it's obvious he could not have had anything to do with Maria's uh, conviction. Uh, I I just, you know, how can you read that and then go and convict the guy anyway? And when you have to do things like omit the, uh, omit the fact that you know where the phone booth is and start giving people this story that it's, you know, at least 10 miles south of where it really is located, that's, that's very sketchy to me. And, um, it, and then again, we have the um, the snitches, the jailhouse snitches. Uh, John Doe, in particular, uh, has since the trial said that there was a deal in place with the prosecution, a deal that on the stand he denied that there was. And uh, it's legal for the for the prosecution to have a deal with snitches. That's completely legal. What is illegal is for them to hide that, to hide that fact or to have him hide that fact. They can't coach him and the other snitches to say there was no deal. Um, I actually got uh, a, uh, a letter that Jack had been handed by one of the snitches that where he admitted, openly admitted that there was a deal and that he would help Jack out after his situation got straightened out. And getting back to John Doe, the snitch John Doe that wasn't identified at trial, he has since complained and actually filed a complaint stating that Clay Campbell and Julie Trevarthen of the state's attorney's office both gave him a deal to testify in Jack's trial, and then they never held up their end of the deal. So that's... Yeah. That that looks bad. Yeah. Uh, that looks to me that looks like misconduct. That, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, yeah. If, if if you're going out of your way, if you're really out to solve 
solve the crime or get justice. You just sort of present and you gather as much information as you can, evidence, put, mm-hmm. it, put it forward and let it let it fall where it does. But when you try to manipulate things or, mm-hmm. you know, every time you forget to put evidence in or, or do it on purpose, it's, you know... It's, it's right, and, and I'll give you I'll give you an, a, another interesting little little thing. Uh, at the actual trial, Kathy was asked um, by the prosecution how she was able to, you know, remember his face so well, and she claimed it was because she spent several minutes studying his face, Johnny's face, under the street light as they waited for Maria to go and get the doll. Well, the interesting part about that was there was no street light on that corner. It wasn't built until the following year, uh, and it was built in response to Maria's kidnapping. So there was no street light for her to study Johnny's face under. Mm. So it sounds to me like the like the prosecution may have given her a leading question that may have been well coached. Yeah, I I don't know for sure, but that's the feeling that I get from seeing that testimony. Yeah, and and now uh, and I was thinking, it's typical. But uh, McCulloch was uh, in the Air Force, and he was a former police officer. And I, I have to imagine it would have been rough in jail for being accused of, of you know assaulting and killing a child. And being... oh, absolutely, he was in fear for his life every single day in prison. And he said the most dangerous wasn't so much the other prisoners when you were out and about. Uh, through the jail, it was your cellmate. Uh, he was actually in the first year of his incarceration uh, after uh, his conviction, he was stabbed in the eye by a cellmate. Wow. Uh, received, uh, received stitches uh, behind his eye, uh, lost his sight for a while, but fortunately it, it came back. Um, and uh, it was just a dangerous situation day to day. And at the end here, when he found out that Richard Schmack was going to ask that the charges be dis- uh, that the conviction be overturned, he stopped going out into the yard uh, because he said other prisoners at that point became jealous of him because it looked like he might go home, and they were angry that he was going to go home and they were going to stay in there. So his life was even more so in danger. And uh, so he said the only time he left his jail cell then was strictly to go out for meals. Yeah, yeah, it's got to have been tough. Um, I couldn't imagine. Yeah, he was the lowest of the low. He, he, was, he was a convicted uh, child killer, uh, kidnapper, and probable rapist, and uh, he, was a, he was an ex-cop. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's nothing worse than prison, <laughs> be. Yeah, that's the target, Um uh, yeah, it's not good. Um, so, so what's going to happen for you now? Um, where, where are you going to go now, and, and what, what's up next for you? Well, actually, I'm, I'm writing a sequel to Piggyback. It's, it's called A Convenient Man, and I'm writing that with a friend of mine, Dennis Tomlinson. And uh, Dennis and I are, are focusing more on the trial it, itself and all the things that the investigation and the prosecution did, it's more in-depth on the trial. Uh, mistakes, if you will, uh, errors, and plain outright cover-ups as far as we're concerned. So we're writing that and hoping to have that out later this year. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm open to doing some speaking. I'm going to be speaking about this case, I know, in June. Uh, and at some events, and uh, that's kind of what I'm looking to do is, is maybe this has become a dear topic to me, the idea that uh, the justice system truly needs to be about justice. And uh, there are a lot of problems that I see in how sometimes justice pr- is pursued. Um, the legal, you know, a lot of state's attorney's offices or prosecution, it becomes about the game and not so much about the people. It's more about winning and not about the truth. And I think we we as a nation, we don't accept that. 
I mean, when we see cases like this where men go free, there was another one just happened yesterday. A man had been in prison for 22 years, uh, was set free. Um, and this is in the Chicago area again uh, for a crime he didn't commit. 22 years of his life stolen for a crime that, you know, and there's that uh, series that's on Netflix, The Making of a Murderer, uh, where we saw injustices too. I don't know what the final outcome is yet on that. I think it's still going on. But these kind of things, they fascinate us because they're examples of the justice system going horribly, horribly wrong. And that has become something that I'm very interested in talking about and hopefully having a small impact to change it so that so that we will understand as um, as a nation that that's not allowable, that's not right. I, I'm all for getting the bad guys, but they have to be the right bad guys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree totally. And we've done several of the interviews with the uh, Making a Murderer, so I know that mm -hmm. all too well. And, and uh, yeah, it's... Um, I think it, I think I think why it took so much um, attention from people was because they didn't realize what went on behind, behind the scenes. Yeah, behind the scenes, and uh, I think they're shocked. They're like, "Well, that can't happen," and then they're watching it, and it is happening. And uh, mm -hmm. I see more outrage about that uh, than whether he did it or not. Oh, absolutely. Um, it's just because nobody wants to be put in that place, and uh, when you're not rich enough to get, you know, a high-end attorney, um, it's tough. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, well, uh, and, and and we shouldn't have to buy our justice. No, that's the thing. We should not have to buy our adjustment, our justice. Our justice should just be part of the package. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to investigate, you know, and spend those costs to investigate, then you have to understand that even if it comes up dry, and you don't get what you expected when you investigated, you just have to be willing to let it go. It's just the cost of doing business. You know, you cannot try and justify your expenses by, oh well, we got the bad guy, when he's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got to be about. Uh, it's got to be about truth. I mean, we have no justice without truth. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, I have to say, thank you very much for uh, taking this time and talking about this. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of the Z-Talk Radio Network. I'll be back.